All right, uh, welcome back. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker in the afternoon session, Professor Jianqing Fan. Uh, professor Fan is the uh, uh, Frederick Moore Professor of Finance, Professor of Statistics, and Professor of uh, Operational Research in Financial Engineering at uh, Princeton University. Uh, professor Fan received his PhD in statistics from UC Berkeley, and prior to joining the faculty of uh, 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 Princeton University, he has held uh, academic positions in a number of other institutes and has had an uh, academic footprint across uh, the globe. And, uh, uh, Professor Fan has been an instrumental figure in advancing our understanding of high-dimensional statistics, financial engineering, econometrics, uh, spectral methods, and non-parametric methods, among many other areas. Today, Professor Fan is going to uh, talk about uh, his recent work on um, uh, uncertainty quantification for prediction. All right, thank you uh, yeah, uh, for a nice introduction, and thank you all for staying here. I mean, it's a long to today's uh, conference. Very interesting. I personally learned a great deal. Thank uh, organizers for our invitation. Otherwise, I wouldn't get the opportunity to expose other people's application. My favorite application is machine learning methods in, for societies. And uh, when I was chosen to talk, it's always difficult. What would fit the audience? I say, oh, well, if I talk on, let's say, financial fraudulent detection, uh, using machine learning and big data, maybe only interest to a very small section. So, so I decided to talk about prediction because we are all doing prediction and, uh, uh, and this is the prediction interval I intend to talk today. So this is based on joint work with my uh, student, Jia Wei Ge, uh, uh, and uh, 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 the, uh, I mean, uh, the and Mukherjee, and uh, so it was a very nice collaboration. This is really the outline of my talk. I will give you a, a brief introduction, problem setup, and give you the methods. And then we provide statistical theory as well as numerical uh, studies. So this is the outline of my talk. So we all know that, uh, uh, I mean, prediction interval uh, are very important, right, for uncertainty quantification in predictions. So here are two hypothetical toy examples, right? So suppose we have measure on blood pressure and the patient one and patient three, point estimation, they are the same, 125. However, uh, the uh, predicted interval for patient one is much low, I mean, narrower than the other one, probably uh, from treatment insight point of view. Uh, patient number three have higher risk of uh, uh, hypertension. Similarly, I mean, for patients number four and number five, their point estimation is all about 130, uh, but the, their intervals are very different. So there's way more uncertainty in measure the patient's number four, so therefore it may be require more additional uh, monitoring. So we all doing prediction, uh, all doing uh, learning uh, with a lot of uncertainty. So the, the question is, how do I uh, construct a good predictor interval? And before we talk about this, well, the first question people may ask is, what is a good uh, prediction band? We have lots of discussion on prediction, but we really have very few study on its uncertainty quantification. So at the, I mean, in general, right, so we would like to have high level coverage and we have a small width. Uh, of course, this is similar to like a type one and type two uh, type of mistake that we made. Ideally, we want to minimize in both but practically that's not possible. So therefore we probably fix at 95% confidence or predictive probability, and then you know, trying to minimize the width. And this is the philosophy we are all using. So this is standard, classical, I mean, uh, since the, this was there, right? So people naturally asking, what is new you are going to provide me today? And I basically was trying to say, I'm going to provide you uh, universally applicable and it's always honest, valid, uh, small with uh, I mean, predictive interval. Even if uh, your predictive interval uh, itself is wrong, I guarantee my confidence interval, predictive interval is honest, is always valid, right? So this sounds like, uh, uh, like utopia world, right? So that's why we give, uh, give a name called universally trainable uh, optimal predictive interval aggregation. So let me explain a few key words here. We use trainable rather than testable uh, because our result is honest, always testable. So, so trainable basically means that you can run on any small computers, right? Emphasis on the training aspect. 
then why don't you talk about predictive interval construction? We use aggregation. And the main reason is heavily computation for those large uh, big data. I want to dispute many learnings into a smaller task. And at the end of the day, I aggregate those together. So when you use the basic, uh, let's say, aggregation among base, basic bases, like a kernel basis or spline basis, then our aggregation really become uh, construction. So I'm using aggregation, basically saying it's a more general terminology than uh, construction, and also seeing emphasis on the training aspect. Uh, I don't want uh, uh, to be overloaded on uh, on computation of this uh, kind of aspect. Okay, so this is the, uh, the one, right? So now, since this is a very classical problem, we don't have a very good solution. You could imagine, right, for hundreds of years, people given different kind of methods. And the more recent uh, method is probably called uh, conformal inference. Uh, and this is the, uh, initiated by Vogue and his collaborators and uh, continue on by kind of Gimelin schools. Uh, and there's a lot of studies uh, on the conformal in interval. So the basic idea is that you rank certain kind of uh, conformal uh, scores for new observation among the unknown, among the known examples. And uh, so let me get, not get too detailed, any detail of those. So one of the key drawback of the method is the constant width. Uh, and uh, so this is the data that we generated. If you're using our method, Utopia, you construct constant band look like that. And if you use conformal inference like a split CF, uh, that's what you get. So because the constant is <laughs> unappealing, then naturally people say, well, how do I make a non-constant uh, adaptive width? Right? So this would be people easily thinking, is, let's construct 95% uh, percentile and the 5% uh, percentile, then I got the 90% confidence uh, predictive interval. But this problem itself is as hard as I telling you I want to construct predictive interval, right? Uh, so first of all, there'll be model misspecification. Secondly, there will be you no know, com more computational challenge. And in addition, we know that there has something called quantile crossing. 95% uh, quantile regression means not necessarily any bigger than, uh, any smaller than, let's say, 95% uh, quantile regression. Uh, and this is uh, an example I do here, right? So if I use a linear quantile regression, that's the interval that you get, right? So, which is also not ideal. It does depend on x slowly like this, right? And depend on x uh, slowly like this, but it's not, not ideal either. Uh, so this is uh, not very happy. And then the third one, very recently, we got really inspired by, uh, by uh, Lian's work. Uh, he used, let's say, a uh, universal uh, predicting uh, band. Uh, and, uh, and this is a semi, uh, I mean, definitely programming uh, problem uh, based on kernel, uh, kernel methods. Now, there are a few drawbacks, right? First, uh, I mean, it's only use kernel, kernel methods. How about if I want to use spline? How about I want to use neural network? Now that we are a tool at your hands, right? So you would like to use all of those. How can I do that? They cannot, right? And that, that secondly, usually often bigger, uh, I mean, confidence than a, a, a predictive interval two. And the uh, third and lastly, we, when we try it, it's extremely computational intensive. Maybe someone smarter come in uh, to solve, but the, the existing code by, uh, provided by Liang uh, doesn't help solving uh, this problem. So now let me begin with the, uh, the problem setup. It's a very simple right, uh, uh, idea. So let's say I have input x, which, which could be 100 dimensional, could be 1,000 dimension. It doesn't matter. And y is your output, right? So our goal is to construct a predictive interval of y given x. Uh, this is my goal. And uh, so let me find a center first, right? Ideally, that center uh, should be conditional mean or conditional median. But let me, for simplicity, say con conditional mean. Right? So this is the one that I'm using here. Uh, and then YC is, um, uh, is the residual, the difference between these two. And here we make a very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, I mean, assumption that can be removed. So we're basically saying that uh, the residual, right? So given X is symmetric and bounded. So symmetry is not necessary just for simplicity of my mathematical expressions. You'll see uh, later. Uh, bounded is also my, for my convenience that can be removed by studying more carefully uh, the tails, right? So, but let's say under these two conditions, 
uh, ideal conditions, right? So uh, the, uh, after you centering, the random variable becomes symmetric uh, so, and, then it, and bounded. Then you, I, let me denote the uh, extreme quantile, that is the largest value, right? Given x, what is the largest possible value of y? So this is the extreme quantile I denote by f0. Uh, and let's say this is the data. So all those are just the setup. Uh, so far, right? So it's, there's no methodology uh, so far. So let's look at the population level, ideal what we would like to have. So, oh, by the way, this is produced by ChatGDP, <laughs> very smart. <laughs> I couldn't read machine language, but this is very uh, nice, uh, right? So this is uh, population level, you basically are saying, okay, I want to have 100% coverage, right? Uh, so this is 100%, uh, uh, sorry, I mean, sorry, 95% coverage. I want the 95% coverage. Uh, so this big R equal to one minus alpha. Alpha is given like 5%, right? Uh, and now I want to uh, optimize my uh, width, right? So this would be the square root of that number would be the width. So I want to minimize the average width. Now this simple problem turned out to have no easy or close form mathematical solution. If I ask you to solve this problem, uh, this is the ideal population problem. We don't have a solution, however, uh, in lazy case, right? If alpha equal to zero, uh, that means you want 100% coverage. Then I have a solution, right? The solution is your center uh, minus, uh, I mean, the lower bound, right? And the center plus upper bound uh, of your interval. So in this case, uh, theoretically, you have, uh, you know, the analytical solution. So this, uh, this gives us an idea like this, right? So let me begin with, uh, 100% coverage, alpha equal to zero. Uh, that would be over coverage. Then, and now I shrink it to 95%. So this is really the, uh, the idea of uh, our solution. So let me do the uh, population version uh, for you, right? So uh, constructing the predicting confidence band. So again, recall that I have n data points uh, and I need to learn about the center. I need to learn also about the, uh, the width, right? So this m, is in a class of function that I'm going to center my data, which is unknown. I'm going to learn uh, the best within my family, right? <clears throat> and then this f uh, is, is the width. I also have a family of function that I try to minimize the width, right? So subject to 100% uh, coverage. As I say, 95% coverage, there's no analytical solution. But if I have 100% coverage, uh, I have uh, the solution, right? So this is the uh, optimization problem that we write in a very generic form. So you want to find uh, the best center, right? So this is the center that you have here. And then you want to find the best family of, of the width, right? So that the average width is small and the fxi big than this, right? Of, of course, fxi had to be non-negative by this uh, definition, right? So once I do this, uh, then I will construct 100% uh, confidence into a loop like this, right? So it would be your estimated value plus or minus your uh, estimated uh, minimized or optimized confidence width, right? I mean, the, uh, the bandwidth. So this would be, you would expect to have 100% uh, coverage, but you're thinking of random, uh, I mean, the random design situation. There are many of those x, right? Future x, you haven't seen it. So if my function f, uh, the complexity of this class is not too complex, you'll have 100% coverage. But if it's too complex, I need to do a very small adjustment, right? Just to do technical adjustment, you widen your interval a little bit uh, because there are many x in the future that you haven't seen. Uh, so therefore, you make this uh, this hold. Right? So this is uh, so. In short, for VC class, uh, that uh, that you could just use in the first interval. Uh, for non-VC class, you need to do a small adjustment. So we'll have theory showing you how much you need to do adjustment for that highly complex uh, function classes. Now the next issue is, all right, good, you solve 100% coverage because it's a, it's a constraint optimization. You optimize uh, the average width subject to all data being covered by your width, right? Uh, so 100% in PO coverage. Uh, now the next one, uh, how do I solve if I want 95% predictive interval? So in this case, I assuming that 100% predictive interval give you a very reasonable, uh, reasonable shape. 
right? So therefore, I'm going to shrink this by amount, let's say by 0.9, by 0.8, right? So that I could tune that number to make it uh, like a 95% coverage. So in other words, my predictive interval <coughs> would be not uh, plus or minus my band, but uh, times a multiple here, right? A multiple here to make my interval a little bit narrower, so they would be 95% uh, coverage. Now the question is how much narrower? That's easy, right? Uh, because this is the, I mean, normalized, right? So the normalized or standardized random variable. So I, all I'm really saying is that uh, you basically just tune in this one dimensional parameter uh, to make uh, this interval have empirical, uh, let's say 95% uh, coverage or minus alpha uh, coverage. And mathematical definition is the one minus alpha quantile of uh, uh, this uh, quantity. So, uh, so this gives us uh, a general recipe how we do 95% uh, predictive interval. I starting from a formulation of 100% coverage, because 100% coverage, the solution is pretty simple. And now I just shrink my interval a little bit uh, to make it uh, 95, and all of those are, have analytical uh, solution. So, uh, so let me just, uh, just summarize the key steps, because it's, you know, probably we haven't seen this before, so therefore it's not like empirical risk minimization. You are very familiar, right? So, so let me do this again, right? So let me pick uh, or collect a class of uh, predictors, F and M, right? So uh, F is for the width, M is for the center, right? Uh, and now I optimize uh, this F and M, and uh, the, uh, the constraint is become 100% Courage, impure courage, that's simple, 100% impure courage, right? And now I know it's 100% too wide, so I just shrink by an amount of lambda alpha, which is simple, uh, make it exactly 95% courage, right? so this would be one minus alpha uh, courage. And uh, so this is the idea, and then you can see that uh, <laughs> because of the last step of calibration, even if I make a mistake, uh, in estimating or in optimizing my f hat, and even if I make a mistake in mismodel my center, even both of those are wrong. I mean, you still, I guarantee you still have 95% courage because the last step is I choosing uh, the data to have empirical, right, uh, like a 95% courage. So this is really another <laughs> layer of utopia world that we actually, uh, we, we are thinking of, right? So. Uh, this, uh, uh, so, uh, so, so that uh, even if you're estimating the center wrong and you're estimating the width wrong, in this case, you still have 95% courage. It's just not the optimal width, but it still gives you an honest uh, courage. Okay, so now here's a few uh, remarks just to say that uh, symmetric assumption is really just our lazy way of present, uh, I mean, presentation, right? So if you will have asymmetric, that means you have two center, I mean, at the, uh, sorry, you have your predictive interval have two upper bound and lower bounds, right? And now you optimize the, the width subject to this 100% uh, coverage. And once you do, do that, right? So you maybe shrink this part to like, uh, to like alpha and this part to one minus alpha, half alpha. Uh, quantile and and it work right so it just uh, uh, so the symmetry is just our uh, simple uh, assumption and uh, now the next issue I repeatedly saying that you can center things wrong and um, if I send the things wrong uh, what would be the impact right so if I send the things wrong uh, the courage is always guaranteed right so uh, is sorry for the mistypo uh, for the typo there so the uh, courage is uh, is guaranteed. So what is really affect you is affect you on the, on the width. The width you are actually using would be the ideal one you have here plus the, uh, the bias that, uh, that you, you create yourself because you miscenter uh, the data. And this guy, uh, what you have this guy here is the unique solution to our, uh, to our problem. So in other words, if you miscenter it uh, from M0 to this M, uh, and you op solve our optimal width uh, problem, uh, then the solution is also analytical, and this tells you how much you really you pay for your width, but you are still have guaranteed uh, courage. 
Uh, okay, so this is uh, a, another aspect of robustness. Now, what we really have in mind and what we'll do uh, in, the, uh, in the numerical example is that uh, you, know, you have, let's say, for simplicity of illustration, let me assume center is given to you zero, right? So it's uh, center at zero. So I assume that you, have, you want to uh, construct predictive interval with different degree of uh, width. Right, I assume someone would like to maybe use, hey, let me use the 95% quantile as my first try, and this model could be wrong. Somebody uh, using spline, somebody say, hey, maybe I'm using kernel basis, that would be my F2. Somebody say, I learned you know, conditional uh, standard deviation uh, using neural network. So all those are M, right? So you distribute your task into, uh, it's just like aggregated there, I mean, or meta learning, right? So you distribute your task uh, into a different one. So in, at the end of the day, for those people who are using spline, for those two people who are using linear model, for those people who use uh, neural network, for those people who use kernel uh, kernels, uh, function, so you all get in different kind of F, right? And then our, our goal is meta-learning uh, that, uh, right, so this is the linear combination of K different kind of machine learning methods of learning uh, conditional quantiles. And now I just aggregate those together, adding those alpha together, right? So this one basically saying subject, this is the average of those would be aggregate of uh, K machine learning methods. And the, uh, this should have 100% coverage. So this line basically say 100% coverage, right? And then uh, this is basically saying the average width, right? And this one basically saying uh, the aggregation should be non-negative, right? So, uh, so, so if you do this, so this is really a linear programming problem, right? So, uh, so this is a simple linear program problem. You could find all those uh, solution alpha by using linear program. So it's very uh, easy to compute. Uh, in addition, suppose M0 is unknown to you and then you are using, let's say, a linear basis, right? So in this case, this M0 also have parameter here, uh, right, a linear basis uh, here. So now if you look carefully, <laughs> right, this is a quadratic program problem, so you can still solve it very rapidly, right? So this is what we have in mind. You have many machine learning methods, uh, and, uh, and now you just aggregate those together, and you get in uh, the result. So this is the aggregation, right? So some people may be saying, hey, why don't you tell me about construction, right? Construction is okay, as I said, if my ba elementary basis, uh, I mean, if the basis is elementary, right? Like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reproducing Hil uh, uh, Hilbert's uh, space, right? So you have feature map uh, given by uh, this function here. Now, in this case, I want to approximate, I mean, my width F0, uh, by using a uh, kernel, uh, I mean, uh, by using the quadratic of the feature map, so this will be the quadratic feature map I'm using. So therefore, our problem becomes like this, right? So you want to minimize, you want to have 100% coverage, right? So this line basically saying you, I use the quadratic of feature map to control the width, so that I'm, I guarantee I myself have not, is non-negative, right? So this is the 100% uh, coverage for all data points. I minimize the average width, right? And I subject to the constraint that uh, this uh, quadratic function feature map, uh, map should be non, uh, semi-positive definite. And the, the trace or, uh, of this or operator norm of this is controlled by R. So right, you, this is be an infinite dimensional problem. But if I'm looking in uh, using representative the theorem, it's become a finite dimensional problem. It's very easy, right? So you basically saying, let me k and denote by this uh, feature matrix, right? Uh, kernel feature matrix or, <coughs> or similarity matrix. Uh, and now I want to, this is the width, right? Subject to minimize this width. And now this line basically say you have 100% coverage. And this line basically is saying that uh, uh, the, re the trace is controlled by R, and this B matrix should be non-negative. So this is a, a, a semi-definite program problem and can be efficiently solved. Right? So in this case, I'm just using uh, the very elementary, uh, I mean, feature map right, as my basis function or as I aggregation, then I got uh, a construction. So uh, in this space, uh, I mean, uh, Leon, uh, actually uh, solve a similar problem. So his solution basically say, hey, let me optimize this operator norm uh, subject to 100% coverage. 
uh, and then this a, a big R equal to zero, but this is not directly related to the width. So we are way more explicitly, I mean, connect to the, uh, the optimal predictive width. So this is uh, example uh, two. And then, the, uh, ex uh, then in order to do computation fast, so we uh, use uh, the, uh, the two-step, uh, I mean, utopia. So meaning that you could separate, right? So you, you using some kind of machine learning methods, and again, this could be more than one machine learning. You could use a neural network to learn the center. You could use a kernel to learn the center. You could even use in simple linear regression to learn the center, right? So then you learn a center and you could aggregate those centers, right? And then let's say just you, let's say I just use two step. I, I learned this M hat. Now I fix my centroid. So now I need to learn the optimal uh, width, right, to uh, F0, and this will be uh, a two-step method, right? So this is the same as uh, now center being given to you here. Now you are just optimizing uh, through this, uh, uh, this F. And uh, as I said before, even the two M0 uh, conditional mean is not in this class. Uh, you still have, I mean, coverage guarantee. It's just a little bit wider, uh, a little bit wider than <laughs> than you want, but you still have 100% uh, uh, guaranteed. So this is the two, uh, the two step method. This helps solve uh, the uh, computational problem uh, too. So for example, as we do the, see the aggregation here uh, before, right? So when M0 is unknown here, uh, you need to solve a quadratic program, right? So if M0 is known to you here, you are in a linear program problem, right? So it's much faster uh, to solve uh, that way. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the uh, so this is the two-step methods. So now let me provide you some kind of theoretical studies just to show you that uh, uh, that we you know, we have I mean good theoretical guarantees. Right? So in order to study in a little bit more generality uh, of empirical learning, so we need to define uh, complexity. Right? So one uh, related concept that to the complexity in empirical risk uh, minimization uh, is the Radamach uh, complexity, which basically is saying how rich your function f is, uh, so that you can find uh, how big this function can be spurously correlated with Radamach random variables. Right? So this is basically uh, the, uh, the uh, Radamach complexity, which is talking about correlation between uh, spirit correlation between the class of your function and the Radamach random variables, and this gives you an idea how rich the class of uh, function is. And the, the Radamach complexity uh, itself, um, well, uh, it's still a little bit abstract, but it can be bounded by using current numbers. Right? So if your, uh, let's say, the uh, current number grow exponentially with exponents alpha, then Radamach complexity can be controlled uh, like uh, this, right? So you, you, have, you, you have an idea what uh, Radamach complexity, and then this is just a little bit more formal definition of current number, which basically is saying that uh, how many balls <laughs> I need to draw in order to, right, I mean, in order to cover my function class. So this is, uh, uh, this is the definition of, standard definition of current number. And then there's another concept of, uh, I mean, uh, VC class, right? So, we, uh, so the class of functions of, uh, is uh, uh, is the semi uh, is the subgraph of the sets, uh, uh, the VC uh, complex, uh, complexity of uh, of the uh, of the sets, and uh, this is really a, a subclass of. Uh, functions with polynomial uh, growth and is uh, also have some kind of VC algebras. So at the end of the day, we basically are saying the, and this is very, very well known too, uh, that Radamach complexity is controlled by VC uh, dimension uh, in uh, this way. So now let me uh, present you the first theorem. Right? So, so the first thing basically was saying with very high probability, if you do learning, uh, the utopia learning, uh, optimizing mean and the variance uh, center and the variance simultaneously. Uh, so this is the width that you get, right? And this is the ideal width that you have. So the difference between those is the excessive width you have. And this is controlled by uh, how good your function was approximating this f, right? So you're always approximating uh, 
the width f zero from above, right? So, uh, so this is uh, so this delta really reflect the model in bias, if you like. Uh, if you uh, if you in your class uh, mean in your class uh, variance uh, width width in your class, how much you can uh, you can approximate from above, and if the model is correct, the this this quantity will be zero, right? And then plus how complex your uh, function is, so this is Radama complexity of uh, of my f function here, and this is the bound of uh, the function f. And in addition, if you are talking about uh, the <coughs> in, in addition, if you are talking about the coverage, right? So the for a future data, uh, what is the probability my y actually a hundred uh, uh, actually my y actually belong to this uh, this interval? Well, uh, and the, this is the uh, this is the coverage probability, and different from let's say one minus alpha is controlled by the VC dimension, which is now we have two parts, right? Uh, the f and the the, uh, the the f function and the f, uh, y minus x squared. I have two parts on that. So these two uh, together uh, control the complexity here, and then plus this just the concentrating uh, quantities. So in the uh, in this result, actually, we cheat a little bit, right? So we split the data into two half and learning both, uh, both. Uh, I mean, the uh, the alpha, uh, the I mean, the the the, the adjusting constant alpha, uh, uh, adjusting constant constant lambda from a separate data. But but our numerical work shows it's really just a little bit laziness that we are doing. Splitting data is indeed not necessary. Just for uh, convenience of theoretical uh, arguments. Now, for non-VC class, <laughs> we have similar uh, uh, similar kind of results, right? So this is the uh, in this case, your width certainly is a bit wider because I already add in delta n. I'm talking about this uh, f zero and uh, this expected one. So this is controlled by a very similar quantity. So now, in terms of uh, the empirical coverage. Uh, so this is the the actual coverage. So it's uh, divided by this. Uh, depend on how uh, delta when you widen the interval by amount of delta. Uh, so this is uh, this delta should be smaller uh, than the uh, VC uh, uh, complexity. So this is uh, the theory for uh, the, for non VC class, and this is for the one step. Right, you optimize simultaneously for the center and the width. So if you uh, so, uh, so okay. So, if you were sorry for this, I mean, this is a new talk. <laughs> so now I need to talk about for two steps, right? So, if I need, uh, if I have a two-step uh, estimation, so I need a, a key assumption. This really means to be saying a key assumption for two-step utopia. So, um, so intuitively, you, if you think that you, if your center is a consistent estimator, then uh, the width that you're learning should be also very close to the case that you know the mean, right? And uh, however, there's a little bit continuity there, so this is not necessarily always true, and the main reason is, let's say, suppose my function is not very rich, I have only two members, uh, F0 plus F0 plus one, I have only two members, and I make a small mistake here, right? So in my estimation function, I make a very tiny mistake. Uh, so when I make a tiny mistake, this F0 no longer being able to bound this F hat anymore, I have to go to the next function. So there's a lack of continuity there. So therefore, we need uh, uh, we need some kind of uh, continuity with respect to perturbation. So basically, saying that uh, uh, if uh, f star is the minimum right, of this function, and you adding a small constant to it, and that should be belong to my family too. Just just shifting the function f star by a small tiny constant. Uh, that that function should be also belong to my function class in order to guarantee the uh, continuity, and under this kind of assumptions, then we can get the results. Uh, so what is the uh, expected width? Uh, so the expected width be con uh, right. So this is the width that you learn, uh, different from the, this is the, the minimum width you need to get ideal width, right? And then plus this one basically is saying how much the bias you approximate your function from your class. Uh, in the ideal case, it would be zero, but typically you may make a mistake, so this would be uh, the mistake. And then plus the uh, 
uh, estimation error, right? So when you learn the center, you have uh, estimation error that you have here, plus rather more complexity. And similar results holds for, uh, similar result holds for like coverage probability. So the coverage probability is also right. Uh, the two, uh, the two one and the expected one uh, should go to, uh, go to zero, even if you're estimating the, uh, the centroid or the width uh, wrong. And similarly, the result also applicable to non-VC class. The statement is very similar, except now we have to widen the interval by delta, and this has to be divided by uh, that little uh, delta here. So, uh, <clears throat> so let me give you a few uh, examples or a few corollaries. Right? So in the, uh, the, uh, the most basic expansion, uh, I mean aggregation, I have uh, the K basis uh, that I use to, to learn for my width, and these all could be learned from different machine learning algorithms, right? And I have L basis that I use to learn about my mean, right? And then I do uh, the one step, or the just like utopia, uh, in, this, in this case, the quadratic programming. And uh, in this case, you, when you apply our general theory plus complexity for this linear space, is very well known. So the assess width, just to give you an example, right? So this is the bias by using your, uh, class approximation, and this is the complexity uh, of, uh, I mean, of the linear uh, basis. And similarly, the coverage difference or, or the coverage uh, mistake is controlled by this. Right? So this would be a very simple application of the general theorem that we have. And similarly, if you apply our theorem to the example two I was talking about, that, it, that is, you construct a confidence interval or predictor interval using the uh, kernel, kernel basis. So in this case, your function of f become all quadratic function, uh, function using uh, your uh, feature map, right? Uh, and I assume kernel, let's say, bounded by this little b. And uh, in the theorem uh, below, I just keep this m to be arbitrary. So all, only I using uh, the kernel basis, to, uh, uh, kernel basis to approximate my function width. Then you similarly apply the theorem that we have before, that would be the same as bias, and this is the part that relates to complexity of uh, quadratic, uh, I mean, uh, quadratic of the feature map, and this would be the results of uh, assess width and the uh, uh, coverage difference. And similarly, if you're really willing to learn the function, let's say, uh, Lipschitz class uh, in D dimension by using a neural network, uh, let's say the neural network uh, with width and L satisfy uh, whatever optimal configuration uh, needed. And let's say if I learn the centroid, uh, I le learn, the, uh, learn the width by using a neural network. Uh, and uh, uh, so you apply two step utopia so that you only optimize over the, over the, uh, the neural network for the width. Uh, so in this case, we could analytically uh, solving what is the assess width, and then plus the mistake that you made in learning the centroid, right? And then plus concentration uh, properties, and similarly apply to uh, to coverage the difference. And in this case, I assume you have full d-dimensional function. But if your two d-dimensional function is a composition of many lower dimensional functions, there's a theory uh, that. Uh, uh, relate to this, basically I'm saying you just replace dimension adjusted degree of smoothness, alpha divided by d, right? So if you divide d on the right denominator here, uh, dimension adjusted degree of smoothness by the most difficult component of those com hierarchical composition models, the result continue to hold. So this so is just showing you a, a variety of results that uh, continue to hold. So now let me just give you a few numerical examples, right? So to show this, uh, show this, and this give you give you a more complete picture what we have in mind, right? So uh, so here is the simulation uh, setup, right? So uh, we our idea is exp uh, I mean do model aggregation, just aggregate a few machine learning methods, right? Uh, and in the implementation, in order to be fast, we use in two step utopia. You learn the center first, and then you solve. Uh, uh, as if you have known center. So in the first uh, simulation setting, we generate 3,000 data points many times, 200 times. So we use first 100 data just to learn what kind of candidates uh, function or feature map you would like to have. Uh, 
uh, and as well as the center. And then we use 500 data points uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, to aggregate the estimators. So in other words, you apply uh, this linear or quadratic linear programming uh, to find the optimal aggregation of all those different machine learning methods. Uh, and then we they get, give you 100% coverage. Right? So that we also using another 500 data points to shrink 95% uh, confidence interval. So in this case, I really have 1,000 sam 2,000 sample, 1,000 used to learn the basic function. The other part is to learn aggregation, what is the best linear combination, plus what is the shrinkage uh, factors. But the, there's no need, this is one theory it's saying this way, that the other way just for experiment purposes, we just don't split the data point. Everything just using 1,000 data points. So this is, we'll try both, whether I use 2,000 data points, learning basis function <laughs> from machine learning and then doing uh, our utopia, or I just using the same 1,000 data doing both tasks at the same time. So the result is very small difference. And uh, in our mind, I was thinking, hey, you have multiple methods trying to construct uh, predictive intervals, right? So, uh, so one of those methods is, let's say, maybe I want to, uh, whenever I refer to uh, quantile, I really means quantile y, uh, this different square given x, so which is give you like a conditional uh, variance type of uh, uh, concept, right? <clears throat> So in, uh, in the first two uh, functions, I will basically say, hey, I learned this function using neural network, uh, using neural network at level, let's say 0 0.7, 0 0.6 and 0 0.7. So I just const artificially construct two functions. That would be my F1 and my F2 by using uh, these kind of very simple neural network. And then the third uh, function, I really use in, let's say, random forest to estimate the conditional quantile. I could use in gradient boosting model to estimate another conditional uh, quantile, just artificially creating a few different methods, right? And then I could use like a deep neural network uh, applied directly to this square residuals to learn uh, whatever the shape that would be called F5, right? And the last, I have constant one. By the way, if I, don't, if I only use constant one, I'm really f looking for the optimal uh, uh, constant width uh, to, uh, to cover that. And that actually would be very similar uh, to what's so-called conformity, uh, I mean, uh, predictive interval. But here, I'm using five functions, right? One function learn from here, one function from here, uh, one function from here. So I use five functions. Now I do best linear combination trying to minimize uh, my width, and this uh, also split the efforts of computation, but right, into uh, each of those are small computation. Then aggregation itself is a linear programming. It's also extremely fast, so therefore the whole thing is very uh, fast, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so what are other methods that we include? So other methods we include is linear quantile methods, linear regression, uh, uh, split uh, CF, which is from conformative uh, inference, and then uh, SDP methods, of uh, Liang uh, in uh, 2001. And so these are methods are compared under the same configuration so that we can do uh, fair comparisons. So now I generate uh, a few models just to, to give you an idea. So the first one is location uh, scale model and the mean is known to you, let's say zero. So this is the, uh, the function map function that I'm, uh, the data I generate. Uh, so in, uh, this is uniform design. Uh, I mean the uh, uniform error, and this is the uh, the conditional variance in a sense, uh, multiple con to conditional variance. And uh, so this is typical result of our methods. Right? So it seems to me capture the heteroscedasticity of the data very well, and all other methods doesn't capture uh, in any uh, in any uh, ways. And now if you compare let's say the methods, so our methods, all methods have right coverage because uh, more or less uh, correct coverage, and our method has by far the smallest width because we are optimizing the width among all those uh, kind of uh, uh, methods. Right? So this is uh, when I do uh, the simulation experiment with data splitting, so if I'm really lazy without data splitting, so in other words, I'm really only using the same 1,000 data points and this is the result we get. They are very similar, uh, and everything is very similar, so it means with and without is really a matter of technical convenience for mathematical proof uh, rather than uh, the intrinsic uh, uh, difference. 
Now, the second example deviates slightly right, uh, from the first example in which I assume the known mean here is also unknown. So therefore, I need to learn uh, the mean function through aggregation of all those uh, similar kind of basis uh, functions. So we, we estimate the mean by using uh, another deep neural network um, uh, uh, like this. Uh, and uh, now I got a mean and I do two step uh, uh, utopia very fast, so the mean apparently being estimated very reasonable accuracy, so this is our methods. So this is linear quantile methods, so this is British CF and this is SDP methods. And again, if we compare uh, the results, right, so all method are, has the right coverage, they are honest, around 95%. Uh, now in terms of width, because we are doing optimal aggregation, we are doing optimal learning, uh, or uh, meta learning, so we get him much uh, smaller width, right? And again, this is compared with data splitting and without data splitting. The, the result is very, very close. So this gives you the second example of, of doing this. And then the third example, just trying to move a little bit away from location uh, scale uh, example. So in this case, we generate data from gamma distribution with, uh, with uh, I mean, depending on X, conditional gamma distribution. And, uh, and then, of course, we want data to be bounded, so we truncate data at more or less two standard deviation. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, <coughs> and this is the, the method that we are using to learn, uh, the all method used to learn. And now, again, if you compare uh, our methods with other methods, our method has correct courage, honest uh, courage, right? Uh, and then, uh, and in addition, we have the smallest width uh, because we are optimi optimally uh, aggregate a few methods. Okay, so it's remind me to wrap up soon. And we apply this to, you know, to real data because you know, not many people here necessarily interested in finance. Uh, so let me just skip all those. But basically, the, the key, I mean, uh, the key message is that we are always shorter because we are optimized, uh, optimally, uh, I mean, aggregate uh, the, uh, the, the, the width. And uh, this is just example showing that you can apply to multivariate case too. I mean, univariate is just simple for graphical purposes. And when, even when you apply to the multiple, uh, uh, I mean, multivariate data in macroeconomic uh, time series, uh, the story is similar that our, uh, our method is always uh, shorter, uh, uh, is always shorter than uh, other methods. So let me quickly summarize <laughs> and then discuss. Right? So what, it, what do I do to, uh, in the last hour? Right? So first I propose a universally trainable optimal predictive interval aggregation. And the, the word aggregation is used for both purposes. Right? So constructing is part of it. Uh, meta learning is another part. And the training, uh, uh, trainable emphasis is very fast in computation. And uh, so the aggregation really allow us to com reduce computation dramatically because you just learn a few shape in any way that you like and then you just aggregate them. Uh, and uh, you have uh, right courage, small width, and easy to compute. So that's why we, it sounds like utopia, we give <laughs> a name called uh, utopia. Uh, uh, so the method has right coverage, even if uh, these two functions are inconsistently estimated because we are adjusting uh, the level to have uh, right uh, coverage. And we uh, provide statistical theory in terms of width as well as coverage for both uh, Donsker and non-Donsker classes of functions. And uh, we uh, basically introduce two-step methods to reduce computation uh, cost uh, considerably and justify all those by you know, uh, learning theory, and our similarity in result lending further support to our theory. So this is basically the summary. And then, of course, there's a, a number of outlooks right, that we haven't really done as much. It's just um, like half a year ago, we were learning this, so this is just you know, a new result we have. So, so far, we have to do like 100% coverage and then, uh, and then turn into 95% coverage. Right? Can we do in a more, uh, I mean, one shot efficient way. I mean, so far we haven't uh, gotten an answer to this, right? So, so far we have overall coverage uh, that 95% is correct. Can we say in a certain region, 
uh, is, I will have 95% coverage. So it's a conditional val validity rather than unconditional ones. And now if I apply to time series, something like that, right? so uh, how, do I, how does it affect the coverage width? And uh, now if my data learned from Boston apply to New York with the distribution shift, uh, can we use the Boston's knowledge uh, uh, to help me learning in New York area? Right? So, uh, so far we haven't uh, studied these kind of uh, problem yet. And with this, uh, we just put uh, the paper up uh, not too long ago. So this, uh, thank you very much. So this is the paper on archive.org. Uh, 